Now, as you might imagine, every time I conduct research on a given topic or just randomly read about military aviation history, I discover topics and little bits of trivia and information that are sometimes extremely new to me or that just really illustrate a certain point that I wanted to make for some time. A lot of this is also stuff that you don't readily hear just by going on internet forums or just reading an article about certain aircraft. It is really information, niche information, I would even say, within a already niche subject. And since some time I've been of a mind of creating a irregular video series where I talk about some of these things. On the one hand, I think it's extremely interesting what some of these stories are and the information that you can sometimes find. And on the other side, I think it's also extremely interesting for just for you to know about these little things. And for example, if you go to a museum next time, you can see one of these planes that I talk about, some part of their development, and you can go, aha, I know something. And you can tell your friends, for example, yeah. I'm, I'm creating bragging rights, essentially, for you. So as the title of this video suggests, and we're finally coming to the meat of the matter, is a musician saved the ME262. Now, this is a little bit of a bold claim, I must admit. But once you know what I'm talking about here, you might, in fact, agree. There are two companies that try to provide an engine to this project. Now, the BMW engine, when they first tested on the aircraft, it fails visibly. This is in March 1942. Anyway, let's not dwell on BMW for too long. Let's go to Junkers. Now, Junkers, or Junkers, as some people call it, is a company that is of course known also very much for uh, aircraft but they also had a strong engine development section now for the jet engine they called it the jumo 004 and you will also see in the literature jumo 004a and 004b now when they started trying out the jumo 004 on the me262 the engines behaved relatively well uh, they didn't fail like the bmw engines but they weren't ready for operational use or even ready for production. And there's a couple of points here that are important. For example, they were gasoline through fuel like you wouldn't believe. On the other side, they also required material and resources that were getting increasingly scarce in Germany. So they had to find an alternative, a engine that essentially provides the same amount of power, but that is cheaper to maintain and cheaper to build, and that doesn't use the resources that Germany can no longer offer for this kind of project. So what does Junkers do? Well, they come up with the Jumo 004B and they start testing it in 1943. And quite quickly they realize this engine is not like the ones we tested before. Yes, the design is relatively the same, but because of the materials we use and just you know other problems they had in the development that were already in fact known with the Jumo 004A keep reoccurring. And one of the things they notice after running a couple of tests is that the turbine blades have fractures in them. And fractures in turbine blades are very, very bad indeed. And they try to find what is the problem here. And eventually they realize that there is a resonance within the engine because the vibration count of the turbine blades, or the turbine wheel blades, is different to the vibration count within the combustion chambers of the engine. Now at low engine settings, this isn't really so much of an issue. But once you rev up the engine to the max, and we're talking about more or less 9,000 revolutions per minute, these engines are going to suffer accordingly. So they have to find a solution. And this, of course, can be solved by try and error, by just trying to fix it somehow, by making little adjustments on a massive scale with many, many engines and just trying which one is working properly, or out of the box thinking. And at this point, they call upon a musician, a musician with a quote-unquote perfect ear, and he comes to the engineering bunker of Junkers, yeah, the cradle of the company, and he's armed. Yeah. He has as his weapon of choice a tuning fork. He goes up to the engine and he asks, is this the engine, yeah? And all the Junkers engineers around him nod and say, yeah, this is the engine. And then this musician says, silence, please. And he starts banging, ding, 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 against these turbine blades. And what he's trying to ascertain is the vibration count of these blades. And he's able to do so. And with the knowledge that he gives to the engineers, they make two little adjustments. First, they slightly increase the vibration count of the blades to be in tune with what is going on in the combustion chamber. And second, they lower the maximum revolutions of the engine from roughly 9000 to 8700 revs per minute. 
and this allows the engine to function normally or at least better at a high engine settings and it eventually also allows the ME262 to use the Juno 004B as the engine of choice because at this point uh, BMW was still out of the picture they had not find a solution to their own engine now the question of course now is would Junkers have found a solution without this position and the answer to that is probably with enough try and error with enough testing yeah but the clock was ticking the fact that they found a solution this way with a little bit out of the box thinking saved them a lot of time and you might as well say that this musician, in a way, saved the development of the ME262 or allowed the ME262 to see operational service as quickly, quote-unquote, as it did. I hope that you enjoyed the story and that you'll look forward to the next episode in this irregular series that I'm planning. Thanks for watching indeed. And if you feel like it, also pass by those like buttons on your way out and share this video with your friends. Now, as always, I hope you have a great day, good hunting, and see you in the sky.